lot of times there are managers who say, oh, we have skin in the game um, and we're doing a private equity deal and to make the numbers easy, let's say it's a $100 million deal. Uh, well, we're going to put up 10% of the equity needed. Well, if the deal is 70% debt and 30% equity, that means you're using 70 million of debt, 30 million of equity. 10% um, of the equity would be putting up $3 million. And that sounds good. Okay, they're putting up $3 million, but what if their acquisition fees are 1.5% of the asset price and their management fees are 2% a year? Well, now they've brought in $3.5 million in their first 12 months. And so they really have negative skin in the game. Uh, they've really been able to you know, take out $500,000 or have $500,000 to pay for setting up the fund and running it or whatever the deal is, whether it's a fund or a syndicated deal. And when investors smell that out, it just kills the deal. And people think of it as kind of fake skin in the game. And investors will not say this out loud to you. Typically, they'll say, what a joke. Or like, wow, this, this deal doesn't make sense. Let's just move on. Um, and they'll see it as something that's just a waste of their time, essentially. So make sure that if, you're not, if you don't have the capital to put into a deal, that you just say that and you're just honest with them uh, versus trying to make it look like you're putting money in the deal. And really, you're taking it right out of their back pocket when you claim to be putting it into the pot from your front pocket. Um, if you're really just taking those same fees from the investor, a uh, sophisticated investor will appreciate just the more honest, straightforward approach rather than pretending like you have this great alignment. Uh, we have a question here. What is the most appropriate management fee for a fundless sponsor? Um, that depends on what you're trying to do and what you need. So it expresses confidence to an investor if you are well capitalized enough because of previous deals you've done or because of your capitalization individually and your personal balance sheet, if you can say, we don't wanna charge any management fee, we're only gonna charge a profit share, but because of that, we're gonna charge a larger profit share. That's aligning you more long-term. Some of you couldn't afford to do that. Um, and there's a lot of expenses going to put in together a deal and running a deal. So you might say, well, instead of a normal 2% management fee and 20% profit share, we're just gonna charge 50 basis points, half of 1%, but we're going to charge 33% on the performance fee. Or we're not going to charge any management fee or any acquisition fee, but we are going to track in the data room in Excel every line item of cost and charge the investors only to the penny the exact cost of putting together this deal. And we think it's going to be between 15 basis points and 22 basis points. And the highest it can possibly go is 32 basis points. Otherwise, we eat those extra costs. In that way, we are hyper aligned and that literally only the deal specific costs are being charged back to the investor. And because of that, we have a higher profit share on the back end. Um, that way, you're super transparent and very aligned. Um, so I hope that's helpful. But the reality of your business and your situation, how well capitalized you are, et cetera, is going to determine that. Also, you know, I guess. This is about being as effective as possible and having more people want to meet with you, more deals getting closed as an investor, wasting less time with deals that are not well structured. But you know, from a business standpoint, I guess more power to you if you can raise hundreds of millions of dollars, charge high management fees, acquisition fees, um, a high profit share, a low hurdle or no hurdle, and still make money for your investors and have them leave with a smile on your face then you're gonna retire a decade earlier than if you do a route that is super lean. But the point here is to try to, you know, if you've read Ray Dalio's book, Principles, he talks about how when you're faced with two decisions that seem to be at odds, to slow down and figure out how you can capture as much of the benefits and manage and mitigate the downside as much as possible within one smart strategy or structure. And that's exactly what I'm referring to here is that you could still make it so you earn a handsome reward for doing well for your investors, but at the same time, make it so investors come in faster and even sophisticated investors come in quickly because they see how well it's structured and they see the alignment compared to other deals they're, they've shown. So I hope that is, I hope that is um, helpful um, in answering the question. I think we might have another question here. What's the normal percentage in gross royalties in a royalty deal? Um, 
and I'll get to your question, uh, Ijaz, as well. Um, so normal would be one to 5%, and most normal is two to 3% royalties. Um, franchise companies like Subway or Pizza Hut are typically paying a five to 7.5% gross revenue royalty. That can fit into the margin of a food business. Some businesses can pay a margin, uh, pay a royalty of, of 7% and be fine or even more. Uh, some cannot, and it has to be more lean. Um, so this is an equation of how fast does the investor want to get their money back? How and what is the reward for the company in doing that? So in other words, if the investor says, what's most important to me is I get all my cash off the table as quick as possible, that's more important than a big financial ROI. You could say, okay, we'll do a high royalty and we'll get you all your money back off the table within two years, you have all the money back in your pocket. But as a result, we're gonna lower your equity warrant or equity down once all that money is back in your pocket because now you've de-risked and you've gotten that off the table. So there's a give and take to all of this. Uh, if the investor's okay getting paid back slower, they might get a healthier return for that. Some deals we've done uh, give the investor a 1.5 times or two times return on their money. Uh, and then they're out of the deal and the investors are fine with that because they've doubled their money or gotten a 50% return. So it just depends on the deal and different mechanics of it. What if a portion of the use of proceeds goes to buy out the current owner, but the investor insists that all of his investments be used for expansion of the business? So Ijaz, I think um, this might be a case of just talking to the wrong investor um, or raising more capital than you were going to, to do both at the same time. Um, sometimes capital raises are done. You simply just need to buy out someone on the cap table um, and it's as simple as that, and that gets done all the time. Um, but you might say, okay, we need 300,000 or 800,000 to buy out this partner. Maybe we raise 1.2 million and we'll recapitalize the company at the same time and make sure we have more than enough uh, of a runway uh, in case of something happening to the business or to acquire an asset that you need to grow, uh, et cetera, and do both within the same raise. And then you can use that investor that you're talking to now who just wants to invest in the growth for that and find another investor to buy out the equity holder. Um, so you can do both in one deal uh, with two different investors or structure two different deals. If you're an investor in built to core multifamily, what kind of deal structure do you prefer? So this is ground up real estate development, Kurt, right? Um, with the ground up real estate development, there is always gonna be a, you know, a construction management fee uh, in my experience. Um, I think that's that's very common. Typically, investors are looking for like a 17 to 20 percent, maybe 22 percent IRR in that type of a deal. Um, and I think investors will, in this type of an environment, want to make sure that your bank financing and construction financing is solid and that you're well capitalized enough that you're not going to get um, you know, halfway through the project and then have the financing be pulled. So I think having a relatively conservative structure that's not super high leverage and high debt is something that would you know, make investors feel more comfortable. And right now with a lot of investors I talk to, you know, development is interesting because a lot of returns have been compressed otherwise. Um, but a lot of investors are happy with that 15 to 17% return, even if that means there's, even if that means you gave up three to 4% IRR per year by having to be a little bit less leveraged. Um, so I think that would be a couple of important components to it. And then the more that it's based on, here's the actual cost, but we're making all of our money on the back end, the better. So you would know that better than me in terms of that construction fee up front, uh, how much of that is needed and whether it can be documented directly and charge back to the investor exactly what the costs are. And you give them a, a bandwidth of what those costs may be. Um, or if you've done 19 of those projects, you might know exactly where that's going to come in. Um, but the more alignment, the better. Uh, and the more that you get paid handsomely when the investor does very well, uh, the better, essentially. So I hope that helps a little bit. But if you have a more specific question on that, um, let me know. But I mean, the other way to read into what I said, I guess, is that if investors are expecting that higher return, instead of an 8% preferred return or 7% preferred, 
and then a 25% profit share, you could say, well, we'll give you a 10% preferred or 12% preferred, but then we're gonna take 50% of the profits because that preferred return is so high. Uh, and the other thing for investors to watch out for that are sometimes used is um, a catch up. So if you say the investor is getting a 7% preferred return, that might be paid to the investor first, but then if the developer or the GP of the private equity group is getting a catch up fee, that means all those returns the investor got, now the GP is getting, they're now at 50-50 in terms of fees taken off the table or like money taken off the table. And now the fees after that might be 50% profit share um, or 33%, 66%, et cetera. But just know that sometimes that there is a catch up or a fee catch up in there drastically changes the fee experience to the investor. And sometimes it's completely missed by the investor and they don't really understand how the waterfall works. I would say that's true with 70 to 80% of high net worth investors. They don't get what a catch up fee is and it's not explained a lot to them, I found. It's a lot of confusion around that. It could massively change what your returns are. Um, and if, if even after explaining it, you think that that's the way to go for you, it could allow you to say, we give a 10% preferred return, and then we get our catch-up uh, fee uh, on that. And then um, after that, we have a you know X percent profit share. Um, I'll just watch out for making sure it's clear what's going on so you aren't using a structure that's like tricking investors on purpose um, because that just makes people upset or turns off sophisticated investors. So either way, not a good thing.